it would appear that David believes that God cares about the work he does. And for all of us, whether we uh, get paid for the work we do or don't get paid, whether we're at home or we're retired or we're wondering what to do with our time as we don't have capacity or we're on disability, we can struggle with the congruence between our faith and what we put our hands to during the week. Does God care about the work you and I do that is outside of the church? Does he care? And today, we're going to look at a hidden figure, a couple of hidden figures uh, from the Old Testament in the book of Exodus that will give us a little taste of God's thoughts about our work. So we're going to go to Exodus chapter 31, and I'm going to read the first seven verses for us. It says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship. Moreover, I have appointed Oholiab, son of Ahizamech, of the tribe of Dan, to help him. Also, I have given skill to all the craftsmen to make everything I have commanded you, the tent of meeting, the ark of the testimony, with the atonement cover on it, and all the other furnishings of the tent. And then it goes on, and it talks about what are the rest of the things that have been asked by God to create. And where we pick ourselves up in the story of God's people in the book of Exodus is they have just come out of being slaves in Egypt for 400 years. They've had their big moment where they crossed the Red Sea, and now they are in the wilderness and Moses is currently, as we are in this chapter, he is on Mount Sinai, and God is instructing him on what the people of God's rule of life or way of life should be. He's on Mount Sinai, and God is giving him the Ten Commandments, talking to Moses about the culture of the people of God. And then he is given instruction about the tabernacle, the place where the people of God should worship. And that's where we are going to pick up right here. And the Lord talks about the tabernacle when he says, I have chosen Bezalel and Oholiab. Now you try pronouncing that. There is no seminary class where you learn how to pronounce these names. You gotta go to YouTube just like me to listen to the guy, we are learning the Bible names in order to pronounce. God has chosen these two, and, and the Hebrew actually does not give it justice of what, uh, or I mean, our language doesn't give justice what the Hebrew would suggest. In the Hebrew, we are meant to understand that God has singled out Bezalel and Oholiab, and he has chosen them for this task. It is as if in front of the whole congregation right now, he has pointed and said, that is my man. I am choosing him to do this work, and I am going to fill him with my spirit. There's a calling on his life, a calling on a blue-collar carpenter's life, stonecutter, embroiderer. Now, that is a rare thing for us to think about as a church. Oftentimes, when we talk about calling, we hear different stories. We hear stories of pastors or missionaries or those who have been called to work amongst the marginalized. You'd hear a story like I heard a couple of weeks ago about a young gal who was called 
five years old, got polio, crippled in the legs, but felt a call on her life directly from God to be a missionary from a very young age. At 12 years old, a, a, a missionary came and, and was preaching at her church and was asking people to think about going overseas and receiving the calling to be a missionary and bringing the gospel to the nations. And this 12-year-old girl crutched up to the front, crippled and all, and said, I will go. After the service was over, the pastor said to the visiting missionary, I am so sorry. I am so sorry that the only person who came forward to receive the call was a 12-year-old cripple. Well, this young lady was not to be deterred from the calling on her life. She went to Three Hills to get a, a Bible degree at the Bible college out there called Prairie, and she accepted a call to go to Indonesia, crippled and all. And not just Indonesia, but she accepted a call to work in the mountainous ranges of in Indonesia. And in order to get around, she had to hire four to six men to carry her on a stretcher from village to village so she could share the gospel with children. And after some time, the, the villagers started giving her a nickname. They called her Bad Legs, which would seem to be quite the insult. And she did some investigating. She said, why do you call me bad legs? And they said, we call you bad legs because everyone with good legs wants to leave our village to find a better life. But God has brought us someone with bad legs to bring to us the gospel of Jesus so that we might have life. And you hear a story like that and hear the calling on someone's life, and it's hard not to be impacted and wonder, what are we doing for God? It's, it's easy to, to be in the church, and, and we celebrate stories of missionaries and pastors who do these big things for God, and we can start to believe that to God, the most important work to be done in the world is the work of the missionary the pastor, and those who work with the marginalized. We can start to believe that there is sacred work and there is secular work. And all of you who sit in the pew do secular work. We can start to believe that. In fact, you know, John Calvin, who is one of our, our theologians that has helped us think well about God, he wanted to help us think that, believe that that's not true. He, he argued that all work, even so-called secular work, was as much a calling from God as the ministry of the monk and the priest. He put special stress on the dignity of all work, observing that God cared for fed, clothed, sheltered, and supported the human race through our human labor when we work. When we work, we are the fingers of God. There is no secular or sacred divide. There is no primary calling from God and a secondary calling. There was a man a young politician who was wrestling with this very thing. He uh, had just recently come to know Christ, and he believed if he was going to do anything for God, anything for God, he would have to do sacred work. So he, he thought about becoming a pastor. And he was wrestling because he was a politician in, a, in an okay one, but he, he thought he... He should become a pastor. And so he called a meeting with a man by the name of John Newton. Some of you that name John Newton rings a bell. This is the, the, the slave ship captain who transported slaves across the Atlantic 
And he, John Newton had come to know Jesus, but still transploited slaves. I don't know how that worked as he was in his transformation learning about Jesus. And he realized that his work was not dignified, that it wasn't holy to the Lord, that this was actually, this was not sacred work. And so he got out of the profession and became a pastor. And in his transformation, he actually pins Amazing Grace. So when you sing Amazing Grace, it is, you are singing the words of a man who, I am such a wretch. How could God save me? Maybe some of you feel in that spot today. It's like, how could God save me? Well, God saved John Newton, and he did something good in his life. He can do something good in your life, too. But he, uh, this politician met with John Newton and said, I am wrestling because I feel like I need to do something sacred. And John Newton said to him, something like this, there is no sacred secular divide. God has called you to be a politician, and so a politician you should be. This man went away and took that advice, remained a politician, and years down the road, he is a man that we call William Wilberforce who led the charge with a group of people called the Clapham sect to push for the abolition of slavery and the beginning of what we would call the human rights movement all across Europe. Now think for a second, what would have happened if John Newton gave him different advice? He would have missed his calling. He would have missed his calling. That, that is why there are people like, there's a man named Alan Noble who has written a book called You Are Not Your Own. And one of the things that he encourages in his book, when we're thinking about making a career shift or when we are thinking about starting a career, is that we should not ask the question, what is it that I want to do? But what is it my community needs for the kingdom of God? England did not need another preacher. England needed a strong-voiced politician who was going to fight for the voiceless. And I, I think about our text, and we come to our text, and we see that God has chosen, God has chosen two blue-collar workers to do his work. He has set them apart, and he has filled them with his spirit. I wonder what life would look like if you got up tomorrow morning, homemakers, and you fed your kids and you knew that God had chosen you for that work. I wonder what it would look like for all of our educators who go back to school in the next two weeks for you to hear a call from God that God has singled you out in front of the whole congregation and said, I have chosen you to be in that middle school. Chosen you for this work. You are called by me to be salt, to preserve, to preserve the culture, to bring the light of Christ to your work, to, to bring about the flourishing of students. I wonder what it would be like if those who are retired would see God as choosing them, choosing them to invest in their children and grandchildren and in their community to be God's fingers. I wonder what it would be like for those who are unable to work to see God choosing them that when they don't have as much capacity while everybody's at work, that they have the opportunity to be God's fingers in a different way than anyone else could be. You have been chosen for the work that you do.
You maybe didn't sign up that way. You maybe didn't hear a voice of God tell you to go to Indonesia. But Acts 17 tells us that God has determined the exact places where we should live and the exact time we should live. You maybe have fallen into your career, but God could use today to say, I have chosen you to be in this place. I don't need another pastor. I don't need another preacher. I need you. I need you. And what is so beautiful about this this text is it isn't just God just doesn't choose and then off they go. It, It tells us that God chooses them and then he fills them with the spirit of God. And I have filled Bezalel and Oholiab with the Spirit of God with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts. There's another another spot where it pops out and says, I've filled them with skill and wisdom and understanding. And, And the picture we're meant to get is not that all of a sudden God goes over and he taps Bezalel and Oholiab on the shoulder, and all of a sudden, they like have these great skills. They are these incredible craftsmen. They can make anything. What the, what the Hebrew would suggest is that actually God has come alongside the craft that these two have already honed. They have, they have already invested in their trade. They've already worked hard to be carpenters and stonecutters, and the Lord is is the Spirit of God actually is coming around the giftings and the the time that they have invested, and he is breathing life into it to give them greater understanding and wisdom in their skill, Which, which suggests to me that God cares about our discipline in our work in our life, that he cares about us being learners, he cares about us investing in our craft and growing and, and, being, and being excellent at our work so he can come in and give us greater skill and greater expertise. So Christians should be the hardest working people out there because we don't just work for ourselves, we work for the Lord. And that he can breathe life into it. One great uh, story about that is by a man by the name of George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver was in the, lived in the 1900s. He was a scientist and agriculturalist. And he, uh, he developed the concept of crop rotation. And part of the reason why he developed the concept of crop rotation is because the South, the soil was being so depleted by cotton that they had to figure out how do we revitalize the soil. And so he, um, he suggested that they plant peanuts to revitalize the soil, because it'll give back. And just so you know, I tried growing peanuts this year in Alberta. This, I don't think this is possible. Mine did not take off. I have no idea if Ken Jr.'s made it or not, but mine did not survive. So he, uh, he introduces the peanut to revitalize the soil, and he gets everybody on board, but he's got a problem. He doesn't know what they're gonna do with the peanut for the economy. So he's got everybody growing peanuts, And he has no idea what they'd use him for. So Carver had this practice. He had this practice that every morning at 4 a.m., this is wicked early, every morning at 4 a.m., he would go into the woods and talk to God about his work, about science, about agriculture, and he would ask God questions. He asked God, God, why did you create the stars, and how did you create them? And in, in uh, a couple of the journals that we find is God would say to him, that's too big a question for you, little man. <laughs> and then he'd ask something else about rivers or something, and God would say, that is too big for you, little man. And he said, God, why did you create the peanut? He said, that's the right question for you, little man. <laughs> And he said, he said this, when he asked God that question, this is what God told him. He told me, separate the peanut into water, fats, oils, gums, resins, sugars, starches, and amino acids, then recombine these under my three laws of compatibility, temperature, and pressure. Then the Lord said, then you will know why I made the peanut. The Holy Spirit comes around his skill 
and gives him wisdom and insight. 10 days later, he's got 300 different uses for the peanut. And what I would suggest from Carver and from our text, actually, what God does when he comes around us, he comes around us when we wait on him. In fact, in Exodus 31, what you see happening is that Moses is on the mountain actually being instructed by God. He is waiting on God, and God is telling him how they are meant to live. George Washington Carver, you see God, he waits on the Lord. He gives God time. God tells him how he can impact his work. Psalm 32, 8 and 9 talk about this, that God will instruct you in the way you should go, and he will guide you with his loving eye on you. But the only way that you and I can receive, we will receive wisdom from the Lord is we gotta ask. The Lord wants to partner with us in our work. He wants to fill us with his spirit so that we can actually come alongside and help humanity flourish. But so often, so often, we think that faith and work do not go together. That there is secular work and there is sacred work. Would you ask God to fill you with his spirit at your work if you thought your work was sacred? Your work is sacred. And some of you would come back to say, okay, hold on a second. You don't know what I do. You don't know what I do. Like, anybody could do my job. Anybody could do my job. My job is repetitive. My work is mundane. My, my life is repetitive. My life is mundane. I, I don't know how I need God's spirit for that work. I don't know how that work could be holy, how my work in retirement and my work at home could be holy. Changing diapers every day does not seem like a big deal. And what is so cool about the text is this. I didn't read you the rest of verse 31 where it talks about the rest of the, the dimensions of the tabernacle. There are 11 chapters on how Bezalel and Oholiab are supposed to make the tabernacle. Some of you have done a Bible reading plan and you do real great through Genesis. You do real great until you get to Exodus chapter 19 and then you tank, because that is when they start talking about the tabernacle. It is repetitive, it is mundane, it is boring, it is build this, make this, make 50,000 of these, and you think, Bezalel and Oholiab have been set apart for the sacred work of the mundane. Your work is no less holy if it is repetitive and mundane. You are no less the fingers of God in your work if it is not exciting. For two reasons. One, you work for the Lord, and the Lord has made your work holy. The second thing is you bring yourself to work. You see, when you, if you've given your life to Jesus, he has filled you with his spirit and you now become, like Exodus 19 would say about the nation of Israel, you now become a nation of priests, that you bring the sacredness of God with you into your workplace, no matter how mundane or how repetitive, that the very presence of God goes with you as you go to work. Do not call what is holy mundane. God has chosen you for this work. And my hope today is that we would walk away recognizing that the work of the pastor or the staff at Crossroads Church or the missionary you support is no more important than the call on your life 
call on your life in retirement to be the fingers of God in your community, to call on your life as you can't work, to find meaningful work to help other people flourish, to call on your life to farm or work retail, that God has chosen you for a task. Let me pray for you. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you for the story of Bezalel and Aholiab that reminds us that you have chosen some blue-collar workers to do your work and that you have chosen us, and we thank you for that. Would we be faithful to the call you have on our lives? In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>